Growing up, the protagonist, Rudd, hates his elder brother, he has always run after him on all their trips, and he cannot catch up with him. He runs again, begging him to stop, but no, even on days when it seems like he will catch up soon. He stands far away. His brother would always stand far ahead of him, telling him he could catch up. Rudd hates his brother hearted consideration and favor which he gets from him because they are blood. It boils in his heart and irritates him. That's all he thought about his elder brother, but eventually, he realizes what a great fool he has been. He remembers the word of one of his classmates, which state, you have a bad temper and mediocre skills, yet you are pretty conceited. He figures he had always felt the words are a joke, but he has eventually realized the truth behind those words, what a fool he has been to hate his only elder brother, the one who has always stood ahead of him in all situations, the one who has always run in front of him to protect him always. Now, he has lost his brother, and he has realized he couldn't have hated his only brother. He has figured that he never hated his brother. Instead, he had always looked up to him and had wanted to stand on equal feet with him, even if it was barely possible. Now his brother is dead, and he died while protecting him. He died because of him, and he has to keep going. He has to keep going, if not for any reason, but for the sake of his dead brother. He is part of the survivors of the attack by the flying dragon race, and only the likes of him survived. At that moment, he feels the smell of blood. He knows that soon, he will also die as it is inevitable, and he has lost one of his arms and legs, however, before he dies, he must ensure he brings along the heads of some of those bastards that cost him his sweet brother. He sets out to fight the dragons until he sees a vision in front of him. Right in his presence, the figure has the feet of a human, both legs are tied together, and he has a wing. He wonders what the figure in front of him is, and it takes him more than a minute for him to figure out what he is up against. After looking at it for a short while, he concludes that judging by the aura it exudes, he is probably the king of the dragon race. However, that doesn't seem right to him, as all the kings of dragon races are dead. They all died. His comrades and his brother fought the king of the dragon race, and they died with them. He is also confused because he can't sense any power from the imagine in front of him. The figure speaks to him. He asks if he is the only one remaining and if everyone else is dead. Rudd's instinct tells him the person is dangerous, and he doesn't have the time to question who he is and what he is up to. All he has to do at that moment is to fight. He must kill him no matter what. The strange person also sees Rudd's resolve to fight him, and he also prepares for the battle. Rudd knows he has just one chance at it, and he has to defeat him in one hit. He swings his sword, eventually diving the man's head into two, but the man tells him to wait a bit and let them talk. Suddenly, Rudd's vision is blocked by a white flash, and suddenly, he finds himself in a city. He wonders what's happening and assumes he has returned to the past. Just as he is about to move to his entirely new world, he is told that he is going to be a dragon slayer, a person who kills dragons, and as his name implies, he must ensure he kills all dragons. He has the responsibility to stop all those monsters who feel like they can destroy human and that is his duty as a human. As he tries to get a grip on his new environment, he hears a voice welcoming all freshmen who have decided to join the Dragon Annihilation Academy, Iridium. The person narrates that the school was established over 700 years ago, and they provide the best education to annihilate dragons. He wonders what's going on, but the scene looks familiar to him, like what he knows before, and he realizes it's the same day as the Iridium entrance ceremony. He thinks about all the memories he has before, the battle between the monsters, the one that took his brother, he wonders if it was all a dream, but he has a weird feeling. He recalls all that has happened, the fight, even till the recent one with the strange figure that appeared to him recently. He wonders if he indeed regressed, but he quickly throws out that possibility because he thinks there isn't any magic that can make a person go to the past. And even if such magic exists, a dragon lord would not be able to use it, and it can only be an act of God. Wondering if what has happened to him is an act of God, he thinks about the dragon he has just killed, and he wonders if it's a dragon or something else. His head is messed up as he contemplates if he has met a dragon king or a mutant. He decides to make use of the new opportunity he has gotten, a chance to fight a new race, and he concludes that irrespective of who the person he just met is, it whatever his plan may be, he will use this opportunity to fight the dragons and he will ensure he doesn't lose anyone this time around. As he walks into the school, he sees a former friend and colleague, Henneth. He recognizes Henneth immediately and calls out her name. On the other hand, Henneth doesn't know him, so Henneth asks him if he knows her. He says that Henneth is a top entrant and the best student, so every student should know her, and she admits too. He remembers that her first question to him is asking if he is sick, so he asks her why she is asking such questions. She says she has been seeing him talk to himself and curse out at himself for a while, and only crazy people can do so, but she also knows there is no way a crazy person will be admitted to their school. He laughs at her because she is the same Henneth he had always known, so rude and unclothed. She wonders why he is laughing and calls him a pervert. 
They both listen to the boring welcome speech, and as the speech ends, Henneth comments that it is long and boring. He decides to reply to her, considering how he knows she will remain on his neck if he doesn't reply to her. He says he feels the same, and she explains that she could withstand the boring speech because patience is the skill of a magician, and as a mage from the renowned Harpala family, that's the least she can do. She asks for his name, and he tells her, but she claims she doesn't know of him, nor has she heard of his family before. She attempts to keep bragging but remembers her mother's warning about families who can't reach the end of their family toe, so she decides not to cause a fight. He tells him that he knows a lot about the school and that if he wants information, he should ask him. He shows him the guild leader on the second floor, saying they are looking for talents to keep their eyes on. When Rudd looks at them, he recognizes them. He knows of their achievements during the war and even how they will die. Henneth says he can join a guild in their third year, but as for him, there is already a guild for him which is the Midsummer Flames, and the leader of the guild. Lyanna is his role model. Henneth keeps bragging until he is called for his oath. As he goes, Rudd concludes everything is happening like the memory he knows, and if it continues, his brother, Aesir, will be the next to come out. Contrary to what he knows, his brother isn't called to give the speech. In fact, the student council president turns out to be his brother's best friend, Jeremy Duval. Jeremy gives a speech to welcome the freshmen to the school, while Rudd is shocked about the order of things. Instead of going to class, he approaches Jeremy after the speech. He asks about his brother, Aesir, asking if Aesir didn't contest for the president position, but Jeremy tells him he has never heard the name Aesir in the school. He eventually concludes that his brother doesn't exist in that world. As all the student attempt to go into their classes, he wonders if it's possible that his brother doesn't exist in that world. He draws two possibilities, either that Aesir doesn't exist in that world, or he also regressed, and he regressed to another place instead of that school, irrespective of the two chances, he has to find his dear brother. He is lost in his thoughts when Henneth arrives. She notices that Rudd is lost in thoughts and asks him what he is thinking. Rudd tells her he is looking for someone, and Henneth suggests he could pay the guild to find the person for him. He says he thinks the person is in their academy, so Henneth advises that he goes to the school library and find out if the person's name is on the list of students. Before Henneth finishes his advice, Rudd stands up and heads for the library, causing Henneth to call him back and remind him that their first class is in 15 minutes, asking him if he wants to miss his first class. Rudd tells Henneth that he doesn't ask him to follow, but Henneth insists on following him to the library. As they walk, Henneth asks why he confronted the council president asking him if he is an attention seeker, but he says he only wanted to confirm something. Rudd walks, having a clear direction of where the library is in mind, thereby confusing Henneth, who had assumed they were both freshmen who hadn't visited the school before. Henneth asks if it's normal for a student to know the location of his new school before resuming, and Rudd says yes. They eventually arrive at the library. Henneth goes to read about the new magic while Rudd faces what he has come for. He doesn't see his brother's name on the list and assumes he doesn't exist in that world. He says if Aesir doesn't exist, it's because of the Void Dragon Sartan, the Dragon King who controls dimensions and the Void. During the war, Sartan went away with his brother's body, and he might have taken him to another dimension which means his brother may be alive in another dimension, but it also means Sartan will exist there. He concludes his brother isn't there and attempts to leave for class, so he calls Henneth but finds her attempting to borrow 13 books. The attendant tells her she can only borrow 3, and the attendant calls the attention of the authority to the freshers, not in class, so they quickly run to class. At class, Henneth asks him if he has seen the person he is looking for. He says no, telling him it's his brother. Their teacher, Daniel Gold, will be taking them basic combat for their first year and weapon skills and martial arts for their subsequent years arrive. He introduces himself, telling him they have to work to get strength and talent if they indeed want to survive in that school. A student asks Daniel about the dormitory, and the students walk to their dormitories. Rudd walks in another direction causing Henneth to tell him he is missing his way. He comments that Henneth doesn't know the library, but she knows the dormitory. Rudd goes to the training room he used to visit when he was young and decides to check if he still has stamina. He trains, but can't do much. He attempts to blame himself but remembers he is just 17 in that world. He says he doesn't think there is anything he likes in this regression. He will start combat classes the following day, and in a week, he will start sparring classes. If he doesn't want what happened to him in his past life to happen again, he has to do better so he needs endurance and strength. Since he is hardworking, he decides to train more. As he does so, he sees another familiar person from his past life, Balak Steros. Balak is an old friend of his from his previous life who will eventually get the position of the Fist King. However, he is shocked about the timing because that isn't the time he met Balak in his previous life. Irrespective of that, he decides to keep training without trying to relate with Balak at all since it seems like the past is changing. He carries his weight and trains happily but later gets triggered when he sees Balak copying all his training styles and looking at him. 
He confronts Balak asking if he wants to pick a fight with him. Balak apologizes and tells him he has never seen anyone train with such velocity, and he is astonished by his skills. That's why he is copying him. He claims that despite being from a bodybuilding family, his parents don't train like that. He claims he wants Rudd to be his master. Rudd refuses, introducing himself as a fresh student, and Balak also introduces himself as a fresh student. The student goes for their weapon training class. The trainee asks them to pick a weapon telling them that all the students in the class need to be professional at a weapon. As everyone goes for a weapon of their choice, Haneth goes to meet the teacher. She tells him that she is going to be a wizard, so she doesn't need a weapon. But the teacher says she needs it for an emergency. So Rudd goes to her and tells her to take the short dagger. He tells her her mana will be able to control the dagger in a short distance. However, in the past world, Haneth is actually a dagger pro. After giving Haneth a great dagger, Rudd swings his sword. The teacher looks at how professional the swing is. He goes to the teacher, asking if he can take another weapon. His teacher tells him there is no law against having weapons, but not every student can control them, so Rudd says he can, and he takes a spear. He also takes another big sword, and he decides to train with the three. The teacher thinks about his confidence asking him what he was doing before his admission, so he says he hunted and lost his parents to dragons. He gains the teacher's pity, so they allow him. As he walks away, Haneth comes to meet him. She asks if what he said is true and apologizes to him for talking about his family in a bad manner. Suddenly, they hear noises from Class B, they go to check, and they see Balak arguing with the teachers that he can't take a weapon. He insists his family is one who fights with their physical strength, and it is illegal for him to use a weapon. He fights against his seniors, walking towards Rudd. When he gets to Rudd, the teacher asks why he is walking away from authority to meet Rudd, and before he explains, Rudd says they are friends. The teacher begins to give his credit against Balak's action. Rudd assumes that they will allow him to do what he wants as they did in his past life, but to his shock, the teacher says if Balak doesn't take a weapon, he will have to repeat the class. Rudd again begins to wonder if the past is changing. He wonders why the past has changed, he wonders if it's his involvement in the issue that changed the past, and he watches stupid Balak tell the teacher that if they want him to fail, he will gladly fail, but a son from the Starro's family doesn't use a weapon. Rudd hits his mouth and tells him to keep quiet, Rudd knows that if Balak is expelled from the school, there is no way he will do all he has to do alone so he takes Balak to the teacher begging them that they should give an exception for him, but the teacher refuses. He sees a knuckle protector and gives Balak, saying Balak should accept it as a weapon. Hennif laughs at them, telling them it's not a weapon, but Rudd says they will accept it as a modern-day gauntlet, so the teachers should allow Balak to use it. The teacher eventually allows. Their first class eventually ends. Rudd says the first week is calm, maybe because the first class in their school is usually calm and just for the professors to pick the students with potential, and he thinks he has done well to put himself in their faces. As they walk to class, Hennith keeps calling Balak a fool. She says he is a fool for refusing to take weapons, and she is sure not everyone in his family behaves like fools. They get into an argument and keep insulting each other until some set of boys come to approach them. The boys call them idiots, and Hennith asks them who they are talking to. The boys are headed by a proud boy named Wilhelm Part, and Wilhelm says he isn't talking to Henneth but to Rudd and Balak. He calls them attention seekers, asking them if they think they will gain the teacher's attention by requesting three weapons or refusing to use one. Rudd is used to boys like that in his old life, he remembers how they would insult him and his family by calling him insulting words, and he would react by beating them up, but this time, he wants to be more mature. He tells Wilhelm he could hit him without any weapon, but Wilhelm says it's impossible. Wilhelm attacks him, but Rudd dodges it, and Wilhelm falls. Angrily, Wilhelm decides to use a weapon despite knowing that weapons are not allowed except in sparring. Rudd decides to use that opportunity to test the skills he had learned from Balak in his old life, a family skill of the Steros family called Steros style bare-handed parrying. He uses parrying to collect the weapon and hits Wilhelm until he collapses. The teacher arrives, and she is shocked that Rudd can single-handedly defend himself from a weapon with just his hands. That's a shocking skill from a fresher, so she asks Rudd to see her after the class. Balak is also shocked that Rudd could use the skills. He says it's his family skill, and it's only adults can use it. He asks if Rudd is his lost brother, but since Rudd can't say the truth, he says a friend taught him. Balak believes him immediately, but Henneth refuses to believe him. She claims he is lying, and Balak shouldn't believe him. Balak tells her that it's normal to keep secrets in friendship, saying she also has some things that are secret. In defense, she says she isn't their friend, and Balak asks her to be their friend. While Balak and Henneth argue, Red is glad that no one is dead yet, and he insists he won't allow any one of them to die. 
He goes to meet Class B teacher Claire, and after a few minutes of talking to her, she tells him to leave and that he didn't commit any offense. As he leaves, she says that she knows he wasn't wrong and it's Wilhelm's fault, but she only asked him to visit because she wanted to get to know him and now that he has visited. She is so sure he is a well-trained young man. A few minutes ago when Rudd visited her, even before she spoke, he had bowed to her and apologized for causing a fight in the school. He said he didn't use a weapon, and it was when Wilhelm brought out a weapon against himself and his friends that he decided he needed to do something to ensure his friend wasn't injured, which was why he took the weapon from Wilhelm, but he did too much and got Wilhelm injured. Claire says it isn't his fault he should go. Claire thinks about him after he leaves her office. As she is lost in her thoughts, Daniel enters her office. She asks Daniel what he is looking for in her office, and he reminds her she was the one who insisted the teacher's meeting should be done in her office, contrary to where they would have done it. Arthur Winston, the Class D teacher, arrives, also Damien Grace, the Class C teacher. Arthur gets angry at Claire for using the school's funds to beautify her office. She says she only bought essential things until Damien says she even bought a vase. After their argument, they have their meetings. They talk about the students claiming that they think that set will be one of their best sets of freshmen, and they should have great graduation statistics. However, they also need to be prepared for the difficulty ahead, and it's the responsibility of the teachers to mentally prepare tenor students. After that conversation, they talk about special students whose eyes should be on them. Claire says she has two in her class, a lunatic and a stupid boy, and claims the lunatic is Balak, who had refused to use weapons. Daniel says he has two good students in his class, too, and the first is Henneth, which they had assumed would be an excellent student due to her family background, and also Rudd. He claims that he is sure Rudd will be the best student in their set. Although he doesn't know Rudd's family background, Rudd claims he had been a mercenary after his parents' death. Claire says she has met Rudd, and he used his bare hand to dispose of a weapon. She claims she wants him to be her student since she is good at bodybuilding. Daniel argues otherwise, saying Rudd is good at swords and should be his student. They argue until they break the table, so Arthur stops them. He asks Damien to also check Rudd out since Rudd has an interest in Spears too, but Damien reminds them it's the student who will eventually choose his professor. They see her Rudd is from Dissel, a city completely destroyed by dragons, and Arthur remembers it's Daniel and his master who had gone to subdue the dragons about 10 years ago. They are shocked that there are survivors from that incident and wonder if Rudd has developed his skills to revenge against dragons. However, Arthur says he has to counter Daniel's words that Rudd will be the best student that year because he has a student in his class with monstrous eyes. Claire begins to teach the students physical strength class. She asks them to train and exercise, and Rudd knowing how much he needs to improve his strength before the sparring class, takes the class with diligent attention. He eventually masters his breathing, and he achieves his goal. On the other hand, Balak keeps making breathing noises as he lifts his weights. Rudd warns him that his noise is getting too much, but he says that noises like that are necessary if he wants to build his weight. He claims the ability to balance one's breathing will make it easier for the person to carry heavy weight, so Rudd teaches him that all he has to do is to hold the hands of the weight before making such noises, if not, his weight will get slammed. He does as he has been advised, and he sees many changes, so he admits that Rudd is his teacher. Henneth, who has not been interested in building her body, comes to meet them. She calls them stinking, saying that they smell after training for three hours. Balak asks her to join them, saying she will have more body than she has and looks so skinny. He says that the women in his house are built compared to the females he has been meeting in school. Rudd leaves them, and Henneth asks him where he is going, so he says he wants to get a drink. Henneth asks Balak if he also wants to get a drink, but he says he can't walk, and if he does, his weight will reduce so they should bring him a drink. As they walk towards their destination, Rudd sees the wonder student Arthur is talking about. It turns out it's someone he knew before and someone he had fought with in his past life. The first person who taught him that there are levels in life that one can't surpass and their fight ended worse for him, and she even mocked him that she thought he would be as strong as his brother. In his past life, he didn't get an opportunity to revenge on her. It's no other person than Leon Kerr, the one with the talent of the devil, the sword saint, the only knight on the same level as his brother, a renounced dragon slayer. With mixed emotions, he doesn't tell her to excuse him in a calm manner, instead, he screams at her to fuck off, thereby getting her angry, she squeezes her can and throws it at him angrily, but he dodges it. She hits him again, and he dodges, she asks him if he is coming at her because she came to school under a recommendation, but he says he doesn't know that, and he just wants her to leave so he can get his drink peacefully. He is the first person to ever dodge her attack, so she asks for his name before leaving. After he leaves, he finds out he is injured and goes to the clinic, Claire finds out Leon has injured him, and she complains that Leon has injured several other students, so she goes to melt out punishment, but her colleague drags her back. 
He says they should allow Arthur to melt the punishment and they should tell her guardian, the leader of the Dragon Annihilation Troop before they punish her, and she accepts. Three days after, the students assemble for their combined sparring lecture. Claire tells them the fight will be between class A and B. Each student will be called according to their number and they will pick a partner. Each student will fight twice, but they can't pick a partner twice. Indeed, the sparring lecture is called by that name, but indeed, it is an appraisal lecture where the lecturers find out which of the student is strong. Each student will be appraised according to their skills and not their family name. The competition starts, and eventually, it's Henneth's turn. Contrary to what everyone would assume a wizard will do, Henneth calls a sword man as her opponent. The teachers are shocked because wizards are slower, and it's easier for them to get defeated by swordsmen. But she is sure she won't get defeated. Even her opponent Ha assumes that her fireballs are slow and he can attack her, but she suddenly appears from behind him and hits him, thereby defeating him. She wins the fight and turns to her role model, Lyanna, asking Lyanna how she did. Lyanna comments that she is daring to call a swordsman to fight, but she is also a different wizard. She has a strong and fast fireball and is also smart. Even Arthur comments that they may have to get a fireball teacher for her. Eventually, it's Wilhelm's turn. He challenges Rudd, claiming he wasn't prepared during their last fight but Rudd beats him until he collapses. It's eventually Rudd's turn, and he calls Balak. Balak refuses to fight him. He says they are friends, and the rule of his family's skills is that they don't fight friends, but Rudd refuses. Rudd knows how strong Balak was in his last life, and he wants Balak to be even stronger this time around, so even if it means he will challenge his nobility, he will ensure the King of Fists becomes strong enough to help him during the war. He challenges Balak that they aren't cowards in his house, so Balak accepts, and they set out to fight. He remembers the first time he met Balak in his last life after he had been beaten up by Leon, and his desperation had caused him to be a mess. He created a nuisance around the school and fought everyone, so his brother decided to interfere. His brother sends Balak to warn him to stop, and Balak goes to him asking him to stop his brother is begging him to stop. He says he doesn't care about his brother, and if his brother indeed cares, he should come at him himself and see if he won't defeat his brother and injure him. He calls Balak a bastard pig and challenges Balak to hit him if he thinks he can and see if he won't defeat him. Balak tells him he isn't a pig, and in his family, they don't run from fights or attacks, so if he is challenging him, he should know that he will succumb to the challenge. Balak goes to fight him as he has wanted. Immediately Balak gives him the first attack. He couldn't put acknowledge that Balak was strong. However, Balak tells him he is also strong and has never seen a person as strong as him. Rudd takes that compliment as an insult. I mean, he had just been beaten by Leon, and someone commending him that he is strong sounds like a joke. At present, he and Balak duel. Balak comes at him and hits him. He also hits Balak. Balak gives him a deadly attack, and to Balak's shock, he dodges it. Balak wonders how he managed to dodge the attack. He tells Balak that the attack was a flint and asks if Balak thinks he will allow him to catch him. Rudd realizes that Balak is strong. He calls him insane, saying that he had landed several attacks on him, but there are hardly any scratches on his body. He remembers that a physical combatant's soul resides in his muscles. The Steros, of which Balak is a family member, is a family of martial artists from the northern side, and each of them is a deranged muscle admirer. Their muscles have fused with their mana and have formed a thick armor that is sturdier than iron. So Balak's body has become his strongest shield and spear, hence normal attacks won't work on him. He decides to use a very fast attacks. Balak also figures that his attacks are becoming faster, like a snake, and his moves are getting much trickier, so much so that it is becoming difficult for Balak to read them. Despite that, he concludes there is no way to pierce into his armor and Rudd can't win. To his shock, Rudd hits him in such a way that his armor is pierced. Rudd comes back with another attack asking him to dodge it if he can. Rudd decides to go with slow attacks, and he will dig into the gaps of his armor, and he will break it from inside. Balak also figures that he will get hit if he doesn't avoid that attack from Rudd. He sees a familiar technique. It's the bare fist technique of Steros. He is shocked. He knows that Rudd's fighting skills is familiar to his family, but he doesn't know Rudd has mastered that skill to counter any of his techniques. He wonders how Rudd mastered it even though he isn't a member of his family, but that's another issue. The issue at hand is to defeat Rudd. He decides to focus, read Rudd's move, and catch up with Rudd's speed. Rudd comes with a fist fight, and he catches up and counters with his fist. Rudd is at least glad that his friend is catching the attacks. He calls him a genius. Balak decides to end it all with a final attack. He, however, sees that Rudd isn't avoiding it, and Rudd comments that it was a good fight. He tells Balak that he had a good fight and he is strong, just that he isn't as strong as him. That's the same word Balak told him in his first battle with him in his first life. He then brings out his sword, and he uses the sword to slash his body, and Balak accepts defeat. Everyone in the hall is shocked. Is that a duel between students? That's the question in their mind. 
Claire couldn't but comment about how strong Red is. Despite the fact that he isn't a professional yet, he maintained his pose, stood his ground, and fought the battle in a very clean way. Even Arthur says he couldn't imagine that the battle was a battle between students, except for the fact that they both didn't use their individual mana. They were both strong, just like experienced dragon slayers with so many skills. Damien, who didn't have an interest in him earlier, says he is so strong. He says his last attack was one that no one had prepared for. They also give comments about Balak but most of the praise were about Red. Daniel says Red fights like his former master and they have the same sword skills. After a mind-blowing sparring class, Red and his friends go to the school's cafe to eat. Henneth is not impressed that they are visiting the cafe again. She says that the food at the cafe is not as delicious as the one outside, and Rudd tells her he doesn't see any reason why he will spend his money to eat outside the school when the food given at the cafe is free. Balak, on the other hand, says the food at the cafe is rich. Rudd asks Henneth if she thinks money is just paper that she can waste, and she says money is just paper. He recalls that she is from a very wealthy home, and she also has the money she needs. He remembers Balak is also from a wealthy home, and he can afford food, too, so he is the only poor one. Kenneth offers to buy him food outside the school since Balak can take care of himself, but he refuses. At about the same time, two guild leaders of the Pursuer and Clouded Moon guilds enter the cafe to look for him. When they get to him, he recognizes them, although, in his past life, he had no connection with them as they had died fighting dragons before he joined the guild. They introduce themselves as Roderick Riddler and Abel, the guild leaders of the second strongest guild in the city. Roderick tells him Abel was impressed about him during the fight, and Henrith asks them what they are doing in the student cafe. They tell her they had come to remember their school memory, and she asks if Liana is still around, but they say she has gone. Abel says he is giving Rudd an offer to join their guild after school, but Rudd refuses. Although the offer is nice, if he joins a guild, he won't be able to do things freely. He, however, offers them a deal to help him find his brother. They ask what they will gain, and he says they will gain a good relationship with it. It looks like a great deal to them, so they accept. As they leave, Henneth asks him what plan he had for rejecting such a great offer and asks if he had checked the envelope the lecturer gave them after their fight. They all attempt to check it. He looks at the envelope. It contains the teacher's appraisal of the student's skills during the sparring test, and in his past life, he had never received any positive praise during the sparring test, so he isn't excited to check that one. Henneth says she doesn't think there is a reason for her to check since she knows she will be getting positive praise, just like everyone in her family. He feels she is concerned about his brother. He remembers she also has an elder sister who is in a coma. Balak asks him who his brother is, and he says his brother is very strong and courageous. Although he is stupid, he says his brother's stupidity is from the fact that he always protected him, and he died from protecting him despite being one of the best dragon slayers. Balak tells him that since his brother is that strong, he will still be alive. Kenneth insists it's time to read the letter. She reads hers and sees the teacher's compliments, Balak reads his own, and he reads as Claire compliments his muscles. When it's Rudd's turn, Henneth drags the envelope from him and opens it. When she does so, she sees several teachers' signatures. They know what it means, so he goes to meet the teachers. They all welcome him calmly, and he says he knows they want him to choose his personal professor. All of them sell themselves to him and why he should pick them, but he decides to go for Daniel, the only teacher who chose to train him in his past life. Daniel is excited, but he says he has a request, which is that Daniel must take him as a direct student. He knows Daniel is the sole heir of the sky piercing technique, a technique used to kill dragons from the sky, and his brother was Daniel's heir in his former life, and since his brother isn't here, he has to step up. Daniel asks why he wants the skills, and he says he wants power. He wants power to protect his people. He claims he has watched his people die, and he couldn't do anything, so he wants power. Daniel says he will have given him that offer before, and now that he has asked, he will take him as a direct heir. He says he has a request, too, which is that Rudd must allow all the other teachers to train him. He says Rudd's talent is great, and he can get better in several training. The teacher accepts, but Rudd is disturbed that if he takes the offer, he may stop other people from progressing, and it's very difficult for a teacher to train someone, let alone for. However, he knows he needs extra power, so he accepts the offer. Leon meets Claire for the supplementary lecture just as Claire has planned to punish her. She leaves the hall in tears asking if Claire has an issue with her before the lecture. During the lecture, Claire tells her she will go through a supplementary lecture to help her build her self-control. She commands her to start the lecture immediately and hits her painfully in her stomach. Outside the hall, Leon sits by the stairs. She complains that Rudd snitched on her, and she didn't expect that Rudd would go all the way to report her to a teacher just before she hit him, although she was sorry for what she had done. As a result of what Rudd did, she had an issue with Claire and even her mother. As she sits there in tears, Rudd passes by. He sees her crying, which seems like the most shocking thing he has ever seen. Like Leon, the devil warrior, is crying. 
Even in his past life, he had never seen her in tears. The only time Leon cried in their past world was when she lost her adoptive mother, the leader of the Dragon Annihilation Troop. The woman was all she had at that time, and even back then, Rudd wasn't close to her, so Leon internalized the pain so much that it changed her into the evil person she was. He thinks about that and feels bad. He claims that he wasn't the one that was wrong, neither was he the one that snitched on her, but he feels bad for making a 17-year-old lady cry. He walks closer to her and asks her why she is crying. She accuses him of snitching on her and reporting her to the teacher, who, in return, hits her. She claims she is also at fault for hitting him, but he spoke to her rudely. He apologizes to her without mixing words, and he apologizes for speaking rudely to her although he claims he didn't report her, and it was his friend who blew the issue out of proportion and made Claire hear. He gives her a handkerchief to clean her face, and she cleans her nose. He says he didn't ask her to clean her nose but gives her regardless. He tells her he will avoid her, so they don't get into issues again and walking away, she says he could greet her too. As she leaves, he says he doesn't need to help her get better because even in his past life, she trained alone and did well. He walks behind her, and she assumes he is stalking her. He says they are going in the same direction, and they are both going to Hall A. Upon arriving at Hall A, he finds out they are both going to meet Daniel, and Daniel has also recommended her as his student. He is shocked, she wonders why he is like that, and he says he had expected that she would prefer to be under Claire. His reason is that she was under Claire in her past life. She screams that she can never be under Claire and that Claire is too wicked. He concludes that the past has changed again. In his past life, she was under Claire, and she and Claire had a good relationship. But it turns out that in this world, they are enemies. They start their training, and Daniel gives them basic lectures before telling them he will need them to grow through a self-control sparring lecture. He asks if they are ready, but the student knows he wants them to learn by receiving a beating. They both collapse on the floor after receiving several unwarranted beatings from Daniel. Daniel leaves the hall, telling them they will be having group meetings and individual meetings as he deems fit, and he will see them next time. As he leaves, Rudd says an insulting word again, making Leon angry. She reminds him that she had warned him about his words, and he asks her if she isn't angry that they had just received beatings that could have been avoided. She says they were beaten because they are weak, and they are beaten because they have to get stronger. He tells her to stop talking about her lecture with Claire, and she asks him if he feels pity for her. He stands up to walk out of the hall, but she calls him back, telling him that if he feels pity for her, he should teach her the grappling technique since he told her her grappling technique isn't great. He refuses, and he asks her to meet the lectures if she wants to learn. But the only person who takes that class is Claire, and she claims she doesn't want to learn from Claire. She drags his leg and begs him. He is uncomfortable with the changes from his past to his present life. In his past life, he wasn't her friend, but since she is bringing the offer and she is part of the hotshot of that school, he can take it. So he accepts to teach her. Their school, the Dragon Annihilation Academy, Iridium, is located in the center of the Alpia Kingdom. A great demon slayer is a power source to the city, so the royal family ensures the school is treated well and they have the greatest infrastructure. Irrespective of that, they also know it is possible that the students will get bored, so they are allowed to leave the school during the weekends and special breaks. They have a special break, and Balak and Rudd have planned to sleep throughout the day, but Henneth calls them and tells them to help her with some books to the city. They both complain that they have to sleep, but she insists they should help her and that she will buy food for them. She gives the books to Rudd, who in return gives them to Balak. Balak asks him why he had given him the books, but he asks if Balak has money. He says if Balak doesn't have money, then he will hold books. Henneth walks around the city greeting people and buying things until she eventually tells them they can rest at a restaurant. When they enter, Henneth is treated like a queen, she is welcomed, and they are taken to their seat. She tells them they will order the same thing, but Balak requests more muscle-building food, and she allows him. As they order, Rudd looks at the menu and sees how expensive the food is, enough to take him for a month. Their food is served, and Balak asks for more food, Henneth refuses, but she asks Rudd if he wants more. He says in his mind that he is uncomfortable with how loving she has been since she found out about his brother. In his last life, they were frenemy and they weren't that good. He claims he prefers it if she is the same as she has always been. While she treats him well, she treats Balak badly. She insults Balak for eating too much and asks him if he is eating to his muscles or head and says she is sure his head is full of muscles. Balak looks at Rudd compassionately, hoping she will treat him like Rudd. She assumes Rudd spoke against her and asks him what he said, but he denies saying anything. He says he will prefer to remain in her good book rather than her treating him badly. He checks the time and sees that time is 8 p.m. He remembers he has a prior appointment with Leon at that time, so he leaves to meet her. However, she has been waiting for him. When it's five minutes after eight, she checks her time, and she sees he is five minutes late. She feels bad because he is the first friend she has ever had an opportunity to talk to, and it will break her heart if she finds out he has forgotten about their plan to meet. 
she concludes that, unlike her, he is a very friendly person, and he may have several friends so that he could have gone out with his friends and forgotten their plans. As she thinks of all the possibilities, he enters through the door. He says she is already there, and she mocks him that he is the one late. She tells him he should have been there since 10 minutes to 8, and he apologizes to her for coming late. She goes nearer to him and figures he smells of food. She asks him if he has just finished eating, and he tells her he is coming from the capital and has gone with his friend to chill out and eat. He continues and tells her one of his friends bought him food. She is shocked that he has gone to the capital. She asks him over again to be sure of what she has heard, and she confesses to him that she has never been to the capital before, so he tells her next Sari. She asks what he means by next Sari, so he tells her since she is excited to go to the capital, he will take her there the next Friday. She gets more excited. She jumps after him asking him what is in the capital and what the capital looks like. He gets tired of her unending questions and asks if he is indeed talkative since she didn't talk much in his former life. She says she is talkative, and her mother, the leader of the Annihilation Troop, had always insulted her for talking too much. She asks him if he knows her mother, and he throws a glove into her mouth so she can stop talking. They go out to train. He tells her he will train her in the Steros grappling styles, although it's a refined version since the Steros use their physical muscles during wars, and she doesn't have that. He says that Claire is a professional and she knows several grappling styles from different countries, so she can't completely avoid her hits, so all she has to do is to minimize the hits she will get. She asks him how that is possible since she can't even protect or defend herself, so he does a dodging style. She looks at him but can't predict his movements as he drags himself like a snake. He tells her it is called the snake walk, and it's a means of defense when the person tiptoes and walks in a zigzag manner and his opponent can't predict his move. She asks him if it's a skill he learned from the steros, but he says he formulated it himself. She asks him if he is a genius, and she also tries to walk. He says to himself that it took him two years to create the techniques, a year to master them, and a year to refine them, so he isn't a genius, but she who could learn the technique in less than ten minutes is a genius. She asks if she is doing it well, and he uses his leg to fall her. She falls flat on the floor and refuses to stand up, and he tells her he will teach her till she gets it, even if she dies, so she should stand up and continue. Later that day, he goes to his room and rests. He says he had a great day, and everything is going according to his plans, just that the relationships he is building in that life aren't the same as in his past life, and he hopes it won't change anything. He, however, says that he thinks it's going well and the future has to change because he doesn't want to lose anyone this time, so if he gathers his people, then they can fight the bastards. To do that, he must take the position of his brother, which means he must learn the sky-piercing technique. He starts training the sky-piercing technique with Daniel, they go head-to-head -head with each other, and they start their training. He looks at Daniel as Daniel fights in a complicated and unexpected playful manner, and he also sees that Daniel is not planning to lose the fight against him. As they keep fighting, Daniel decides to change his fighting style. He puts out his fist and pushes it at Rudd. Rudd wonders why he is putting his fist out and challenges him. He reminds him that they are supposed to fight with just swords, but Daniel says he gets whimsical sometimes. The fight is challenging for Rudd, who indeed acknowledges that it is still challenging to go head on with Daniel, so he shifts to the back as if he is withdrawing, causing Daniel to wonder if he is trying to lure him closer. Irrespective of Daniel's fear, Daniel decides to play along, so Rudd will show him what he has. As Daniel gets closer to Rudd, Rudd decides to go by the law, and he flings his sword towards Daniel to guard and counters it immediately. The sky-piercing technique is a sword that protects. It's a guarding slash that blocks the enemy's attacks and a countering slash that parries the enemy's attack. In his last life, the only reason he learned the sky-piercing technique is to at least catch his brother's toe, but the true sky-piercing technique needs another element that isn't a sword technique. After the duel, Daniel commends his guarding and countering technique. He says that his slashes are amazing and that he can't come up with any critics against him. He says he has great workmanship, as if he has been learning the technique for a long while, refusing to get flattered by a compliment that doesn't reach his level. He tells Daniel that Daniel is only sweet-talking him and that Daniel can block all the attacks without missing any. Daniel says it is time for them to start making proper progress, Rudd wonders what he means by proper progress, and Daniel explains that sky-piercing technique doesn't refer to just swordsmanship. In fact, someone who isn't the successor of the technique can learn swordsmanship, but by the mana management techniques, he says the technique can only be transferred to successors, and it is only by adding the mana management technique that the sky piercing can be successfully done. He explains that mana is an unrefined life force, and it is common sense for them to save their manas in their heart, which is the center of life, but the sky piercing technique doesn't work like that. 
Rather, it attracts and uses external mana in a unique way through mana imprints. He touches the side of his hands and shows his mana imprints. Through mana imprints, the successors of sky piercing techniques manage mana accumulated in a subspace called the Heavenly Spirit, and their heart is only used as a channel and not a reservoir. Rudd remembers that his brother also had that mana imprint in his past life. Daniel continues his explanation by telling him that the power and efficiency of the imprint are overwhelming, hence if the heart is already full of mana, its function as channel drops. He asks him if he is training another mana technique, and Rudd says no. Rudd remembers that the mana technique he used in his last life is a typical alchemy art, and it was based on the wizard's circle system. Daniel tells him to take a seat. He says it's faster if Rudd experiences what he is saying himself, and he asks Rudd where he will want his mana imprint to be. Rudd decides to put it on the back of his hand just like his brother, and he stretches his hands towards Daniel, who warns him that it will sting a bit, and he goes ahead to put the imprint. After doing that, the process turns out to be more than just a sting as Rudd says it feels like his hand is on fire. He suddenly finds himself in another location, like a heavenly place. He can feel the overflow of mana, the power of generations which is being passed into him, the sky-piercing technique. As he stands there, he hears someone call out for him, saying, That's you, little child before he can say or do anything. Daniel calls out for him, and he wakes. Daniel asks him how was the piercing sky he faced for the first time, and he says it was wonderful. Daniel explains that mastering the mana management for the first time is like getting another organ of the body, and he will need a long time to adapt to feeling and using mana. However, he claims it is impressive that Rudd is aware of the circulating mana, and at that point, he puts his head up and sees Rudd using the mana drawn from the heavenly spirit. He is shocked that Rudd not only knows how to control the mana but can even draw it within a few minutes. He wonders who Rudd is. Meanwhile, Rudd remembers when he trained in the alchemy arts, then, the circle of his hearts represented the mana stages, but for sky-piercing technique, the stages are represented through the number of wings. The Sky Sword Immortal had seven wings, and so also did his brother because he remembers his brother saying he wanted the eight wings. Right now, he is just one wing for now. After their training, Daniel tells him the mana imprint is engraved on the soul and not the body, so it can never be removed despite any rigorous process since it's not on the body and even if the mage dies his spirit, skills, and knowledge will be stored in the heavenly spirit. Rudd remembers he has just gone to the heavenly spirit, and the only person he met there is Daniel, who called him a little child, and he didn't meet his brother there. At least if his brother is even dead, his spirit should be there. He assumes that since Daniel didn't say anything about a person who has been taken into another dimension, there is a possibility that his brother is there. He knows that the only way he can know what happened to his brother is when he confronts Sartanen, the Void Lord. As he walks away from the hall, he meets his friends, and Henneth screams at him. She asks him why he is late and if he wants her to teach Balak alone. He tells her to go ahead with Balak and that he will catch up with them, but she refuses. She says she can't deal with a blockhead like Balak alone, and Balak says he isn't stupid. He thinks of whether he is under the influence of magic and claims he has to train himself better to remove himself from such influence. They walk together and Henneth asks Rudd how his lectures were. Rudd has met with each of the lecturers for their respective classes, and Arthur and Claire are so impressed by him. He tells Henneth that the lectures are just like normal classes and there is nothing special, but Henneth begs to defer. She claims he has personal lectures with four teachers, and all the other students are complaining about the discrimination, so he can't say the classes are normal. She asks him if he has met Damien and if he has seen Damien without his mask. She says she heard Damien is mysophobia. He remembers his meeting with Damien. When he entered the office, Damien welcomed him with a cup of tea without having any conversation with him. After drinking the tea and sitting for some time, Damien asks him if he enjoyed it and says it's the one drunk by dignitaries. He wonders how Damien knew because Damien didn't drink the tea, and when the class ended, he left. He tells Henneth that he didn't do anything special with Damien, and all they did was drink tea. He asks them how their lectures went, and Balak is excited about his class with Claire. He says Claire is an excellent teacher, and she commended his muscles. He remembers that Claire and Balak had a great relationship in his past life, too, because they were both suckers for muscles. He asks Henneth about her class, but she says it's nothing to write home about. She says her teacher told her she couldn't do well with flame magic and she should learn any other magic, and that is very annoying because they all know how rare it is. He comforts her and tells her that if she doesn't like her teacher, she can ask to change teachers, but she thinks it's not needed since there is actually no magic teacher in the school, so it's a fruitless attempt. As they talk, the school council president, Jeremy, meets them. He greets them and says that he has met Rudd before. He asks if Rudd and Henneth are arguing and says they are the easiest to point out fresher in the school. 
He says he has heard about Rudd, and in fact, all the senior students are angry about the treatment he is getting from the lectures. Rudd asks him if he is coming to relay the complaints from his colleagues, but he says no. He claims he has come to ask Rudd if Rudd would like to join the school council. He says they need manpower and he thinks Rudd is a good fit. But Rudd refuses. He says he doesn't want to. Jeremy replies that it's not like he will take him as a mercenary, and he knows from the bruises on his body that he is a mercenary. He says he doesn't like interfering in people's lives, but he is called a detective who can find out things, and he knows Rudd is a weird person with a mission of finding his brother. Rudd, for any reason, doesn't want to have any relationship with Jeremy. He knows about Jeremy in his past life and how he is called the decision maker due to his selfish decisions, which ended up causing the loss of life during the war. He insists that he doesn't want to join Jeremy and walks away, but Jeremy says he is interested in him. Henneth tries to apologize to Jeremy for Rudd's rude acts and he tells them it's fine. He goes to their book, drops a letter and apologizes for disturbing them from reading. After he leaves, Rudd returns, Henneth asks why he was that rude to Jeremy, and he tells her that nothing good will come from relating with a person like Jeremy. As they open their book, they see the letter Jeremy dropped, and the letter says to be careful of Damien Grace. Rudd gets angry. If there is anyone to be careful of, it's Jeremy himself. Jeremy made selfish decisions, and Damien was the first person to die in the school due to Jeremy's decision. He says it's not like Jeremy killed Damien because Damien killed himself, but Jeremy pushed him into doing that. He doesn't know if Jeremy has started with the same plan of pushing Damien to the limit. Then he has to do something to stop it because the death of Damien caused a big issue in the academy in his last life, and he can't allow for such to happen in this life. He leaves his room and joins Leon on the bus to the capital. As he gets there, she asks him why he comes late every time they plan to meet, and he tells her he is there on time and he isn't late, but she says that when there is an appointment, it is common courtesy for a person to be there 10 minutes before the time. He claims he has showed her his respect by leaving his weekend to take her out but she claims he is the one who invited her out. In response, he says it's because she is crying like a baby about not being in the capital before. They argue until they get to the capital, and when they touch down, Leon is excited. She says the Dragon Annihilation troop is large, but the capital is larger with much more people. She asks him where they are going, and he says he will only hold her bag while she visits anywhere she wishes, but she refuses, claiming she is a tourist and he is her guide. He tells her to try to buy things since that's what females do when they go out, so she enters into a clothes store. She sees a white dress and says it's pretty, she asks him if he likes it, but he says it's just white. She reluctantly decides to test the dress on her body, and she likes it, so she buys it. As they are about to leave, she decides to buy him a dress, too. She asks the attendant to find him a great dress, and when he wears it, she likes how it fits his body, and she pays. They also go to a restaurant to eat. As they finish eating, they walk home, and she talks about how delicious the meal is. She says she wants to pay for his meal, but he quickly pays and asks why so he tells her she had bought him clothes and he will be shameless if he is expecting her to pay for her meal, too. She looks at him and comments that the dress is nice on him. He notices she is staring at him, so he asks her why she is looking. She asks him if he had comrades when he worked as a mercenary, and he replies affirmatively, although when he had comrades was when he was a dragon slayer in his past life. She asks him if he took his comrades as family, and he says he didn't know. He tells her he is spouting loads of bullshits, but she claims she has never seen anyone like him before. He gets angry at her question, and it leads to a fight between them. He tells her he is tired of wasting his time and that he is going back home. As he turns to leave, she hits him, telling him they still have some time left. She says her mother's words about how friendship is a relationship that helps one another, so she has changed their plan and they are going to her house, so he can see what family is, and she is introducing him to her family. And that's how the first part of this man wins. Well guys, if you like this video and you want a second part, comment below with the word apologizes also subscribe to the channel, hit the bell and like the video. But most important, leave a comment. Until the next video.